Welcome to Digo Beginners Bootcamp. This video is intended for those who are Digo novices. Maybe you have a basic awareness of Digo and what it's supposed to do. Maybe you even have an account, but you haven't yet managed to include it into your daily workflow. Digo is an example of what is called a social bookmarking tool. And it has lots of fancy, social, collaborative features to help you find new resources, develop a professional learning network, or do collaborative research. For example, you can leave annotations on websites, highlights, or sticky notes that others can see and contribute to as well. But baby steps. New users, or the technophobic, shouldn't get confused or distracted by all that terminology or even the fancy features. At its core, the way that it's used most often by most people, it's simply an online favorites or bookmarks list, similar to what your browser offers, with added features to make it easier to organize your resources. Of course, the most important feature is the ability to access all of your bookmarks from any computer, any browser, anywhere you have internet access. Just go to Digo, sign in, and your resources will be available, like your web-based email or a zillion other online resources. Obviously, for computers that you use all the time, you can set up Digo inside your browser so that it's automatically available without signing in, most of the time at least. Step one, obviously, is to sign up for a Digo account if you don't already have one. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, it's like signing up for pretty much anything else. Except to note that educators are entitled to a special educator account, which would allow you to create non-email based, restricted privacy student accounts, among some other interesting features. My personal feeling is that educator accounts aren't really that critical at the upper school level, where we would prefer students to have, maintain, and keep proper grown-up accounts of their own. But educator accounts are free, so if you want to play with it, go ahead and sign up. Also note that you can very easily sign up for Digo with one click using Facebook, Twitter, Google, or Yahoo. And for ISP folks, our Google Apps for Education accounts will work with one click. So you can just click in, choose your ISP account, and it should register you automatically for Digo. The next step, before I even show you how to save a bookmark, is to incorporate Digo into your browser. Don't skip this step. Many people do. But without it, you won't be gaining much convenience by using Digo. The reason that bookmarks are usually stored in a browser is somewhat obvious. This is where you find cool stuff that you want to bookmark, and this is where you need your bookmarks in order to find your way back to those resources. So, in order to make it a practical part of your daily workflow, we need to make adding a bookmark while surfing quick and easy. Digo actually offers three different ways to integrate itself into your browser, ranging from extremely minimal to a full-blown browser extension. For non-techies, knowing which one to choose can be a little bit confusing, so let me go over your options. You can get full browser plugins or extensions by searching for Digo in the Firefox add-in marketplace or the Chrome store or whatever the app store is for the browser that you prefer. The full-blown extensions gives you in-browser access to all of your links, plus access to your groups and your lists, and all the other advanced tools right on a convenient menu bar in browser, highlighting, capturing, reading later, this sort of thing. Personally, I don't really recommend these extensions, partly because I don't really use the advanced tools, but mostly because I hate things that clutter up my screen and my toolbars while I'm trying to surf, and adding too many bloated extensions and plugins is a surefire way to make your browser behave badly. Most users, especially new users, can probably get away with using the smaller, more pared-down Digolette, which opens up a much smaller, less obtrusive menu bar, or even the simple Post to Digo button, which is just a simple bookmark which brings you directly to adding a new bookmark to your library without all of the other features interfering with your surfing. Installing either one of these buttons is a breeze on basically any browser. They're basically just bookmarks themselves. You just need to make sure that your bookmarks toolbar is enabled in your browser. In Chrome, you access that under View and just click on the Always Show Bookmarks bar. Incidentally, since we're looking at it, I think the bookmarks toolbar is a great place to stick all of the links that you use every day, your email, your Facebook, Wikipedia, the sort of links that you wouldn't necessarily want to save or share in a Digo library, but tools where you want a button handy to take, them, take you there quickly when you need it. If you'd like help customizing your browser's bookmarks toolbar, let me know. It isn't exactly the same thing as refining your use of Digo, but it's kind of logical to address both of these at the same time. But I digress. After revealing your bookmarks toolbar, you can go to... The page for the Digolet should automatically identify which browser that you're surfing with and offer you the button 
that works with your browser. All you have to do is click and drag the button up onto your bookmarks bar, and that's it. You're done. From here on in, if you want to load the Degolette, you just have to click on the button. Installing the even simpler Post to Digo button is pretty much the same. You just go to the page, look for the button, and drag it onto your toolbar. Once you've done that, all you need to do to post something to your library is navigate to the page, let's say this one, and if you want to save it to your Digo library, you just click the Post to Digo button and a window will pop up giving you the opportunity to add tags and save that particular page to your library. That little bit of setup is going to make our lives a lot easier once we settle down to actually use Digo, which we're going to do right now. Setting aside some of the advanced features, the annotations, the sticky notes, the stuff like that, Digo has basically three core functions that the beginning user needs to worry about. Saving, organizing, and sharing. But the great thing about Digo is you can accomplish all of these functions in one simple step. Let me demonstrate using this article from Wired Magazine. If I want to save this article into my library using the tools that we've already installed, it's quite simple. As I showed you before, I'm just navigating to the page I want to save, and in this case, I'll click the Post to Digo button. It's this window that's really useful and allows you to accomplish all of the functions in one step. You can add a description for your own organizational purposes, you can add tags, but if all you want to do is save it, you just click the Add New Bookmark and the saving part of it is accomplished. If you've decided to go the Degolette route, the process is pretty much exactly the same. If you need to, you can click on Degolette to expose your toolbar, then you just go over and hit the bookmark button. You get pretty much the exact same window with an opportunity to write in a description, add some tags, do some sharing, and of course to just save the bookmark. One more time, this time using the full browser extension by way of example, you're just navigating to the page that you would like to save into your favorites list, you're looking for the bookmarks button, and not surprisingly, this very same uh, window appears with all of the same fields for adding a description, choosing tags, doing some sharing, um, and saving it to your library. Please bear in mind that although we're focusing on how to perform these tasks inside your browser, because that's the fastest way, the way that you would normally be doing it, you can always go to the main Digo website and add things manually by looking for my library, clicking the add bookmark button, and then simply pasting in or typing in the URL that you want to save. As you can see, no matter which way you approach it, the basic saving part is easy. Go to the page, click save bookmark. That's about it. In terms of organization, the basic unit of organization for Digo is definitely tagging. If you want to use Digo effectively, you need to wrap your head around this idea, which you should be at least slightly familiar with. These days, it is pretty much the ubiquitous way of organizing all sorts of things. Videos, blog posts, emails. If you think about how it works and how we used to classify and sort things, it's pretty easy to see the advantages of tagging. In the old Dewey Decimal System, a book could only go on one single shelf which was assigned a very specific number associated with a very specific topic, regardless of whether or not a book might touch upon any number of subjects or ideas. In traditional computing, things are primarily organized with a system of folders and subfolders. These hierarchical structures give us a little bit more freedom to organize things in useful ways. Tagging takes that another step further. Any resource in your library can be tagged with any number of keywords, ranging from very broad to very specific. If you think about it like a traditional library, it's like being able to put a single book on many different shelves at the same time, so that no matter what shelf you're looking at, the resource is right there in front of you. So if you look at my tags, if I click on EdTech for example, you'll notice that most of my links are tagged with a number of different tags. So I have EdTech for educational technology, but if I also look on my blogging shelf or my EduBlog shelf, I'll also find this particular resource, which makes it very, very convenient when I'm looking for material. My main piece of advice here is to use at least two or three different tags, both broad and specific, for each resource that you save. For example, you might find it useful to tag this resource as psychology if you teach that course. It would definitely be useful to be able to click on one psychology tag to see all of those resources bundled together. But obviously, psychology is a hugely broad subject, so if you're looking for something specific later on, using additional, more specific tags like cognition, or Freud, or ethics, or in this particular case, mental health, the internet, 
Um, that's probably going to help you find the article much more easily later on. My second piece of advice is to try and be consistent with your tagging. This can be difficult at first, but it becomes easier if you use the service all the time. To use the psychology example again, maybe you would prefer to use the short form psych as a tag. This is fine until you forget and start using the full word psychology to tag a bunch of articles. In effect, creating two shelves of resources instead of one. Now, you can always fix this sort of thing later on. You just go to the Digo library and you can edit um, the information related to the bookmark and you can change the tags. But obviously, it's much more simple and much easier to be mindful while you're doing the tagging the first time. My last piece of advice related to tagging is to be mindful of others. Of course, primarily, you're trying to create a system of organization that's useful to you. But if you're planning on using Digo to share your library or parts of it, using a bunch of secret codes which are indecipherable to others as your tags is not very helpful. This is particularly important as you participate in groups, where community standards for tagging are important in order to develop a usable resource. Now, Digo tries to make this as easy for you as possible. Notice that when you try and save an article to your library, um, Digo offers several recommended tags. Now, for most bookmarks, Digo simply observes how other users in the Digo universe have tagged that article and offers you those suggestions. In the case of groups, groups often use a tag dictionary, which is a list of recommended tags. For example, our International School of Prague Upper School group will suggest specific tags associated with the specific subjects. This makes it very easy for everybody to use the same tags for the same subjects when sharing resources. So, tags are the most important way to organize your Digo library, and it's the strategy that you should be using most often. However, there is one other tool related to organization that I probably should mention, and that's lists. So, in addition to your tags, you can also take resources from your library and isolate them onto particular lists. Now, when I first started using Digo, I wondered to myself what the advantage was of using a list when I could just, uh, you know, create a, a tag for those resources and do it that way. Um, well, I think I've come up with a couple of good reasons. Um, so, if you look at lists, you'll notice, first of all, that Digo keeps different statistics on who visits your lists. So if you're a teacher collecting resources for students, knowing how many students have actually looked at that list might be informa interesting information for you. Um, in addition, a list has, if you just click the edit button here, a little description field. So again, if you're doing a, a focused activity like a web quest, maybe you want to use this field to give some direction or some instructions to your students. Um, but generally speaking, I think lists are great for when you want to present a few resources to students in a very, very focused way, and you don't necessarily want to distract them with every resource in your library. This brings us pretty conveniently to the sharing part of this presentation. How do you actually give out your library or parts of your library to other people? So if you're looking at your list, there's a share button. You just click on the share button, and it allows you to grab a link. All lists have their very own particular link. If you go to the main part of your library, it has a particular link too. Just look up here. It's digo.com backslash user backslash whatever your username is. That is a direct link to your entire library. So you can just take that link and email it to people as easy as that. In addition, every particular link in your library has its own URL or address also. So if I click on religion and then look way up here, in the um, address bar, I can just copy um, that address and share all my resources related to that particular um, tag to somebody just by emailing the link. So that's very, very easy as well. Now, hopefully at some point, you're going to get on to joining and participating in groups. If you do, please notice that in the add new bookmark window that pops up every time you go to add a new bookmark, you can add a resource to a list. Um, or share it to a group while you are saving the bookmark initially, making it very, very easy to share resources. Like everything else in Digo, um, if you forget to share while you're saving it initially, you can always go in here and edit the resource, and that will give you the opportunity to sort of post facto add it to one of your lists or share it out to a group. So, in my humble opinion at least, those are the most important core skills you need to know if you want to be a Digo master. Now there's a lot further we can go with this. 
including all those annotation tools I mentioned previously, and also things like embedding the tag cloud on your blog or website or wiki or something like that. But we will leave that for more advanced lessons later on.